Great. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Sierra Club's Hangout, celebrating the Wilderness Act. Tomorrow is actually the uh, 50th anniversary of when President Johnson signed the Wilderness Act uh, into law. And uh, really excited today to have uh, three folks join us to talk about their wilderness experience and what wilderness uh, means to them. Uh, we have with us today Rue Mapp, who's the executive director and founder for Outdoor Afro, a social media and social networking site that helps uh, engage African Americans with the outdoors and celebrate. Uh, Paul Miller, also known as DJ Spooky, uh, internationally renowned musician and uh, multimedia artist. And uh, of course, Michael Brune, the executive director for the Sierra Club. What's kind of cool is the three of them all uh, were together uh, the week before the 4th of July up in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, a place that's surely worthy of wilderness protection. And we just thought it'd be great to have them share their experiences and their insights on wilderness and what it means to them and uh, what they hope to see over the next 50 years for wilderness protection. So with that, uh, this hangout today will be about 30 minutes long. Um, each of the three folks will have about uh, three or five minutes of comments and we want to leave plenty of time uh, for all of you out on the hangout to submit questions um, and uh, we'll get to answer those as, as well as we can. So with that, let me just turn it over to Rue and then she'll turn it over to uh, Paul and then Paul will turn it over to Michael. So with that, Rue, go ahead. Well, first of all, thank you so much for hosting this hangout and thank you so much for facilitating the whole reason why all together and that was our wonderful Arctic expedition um, back in July. Definitely a game changer. It was the first time I had experienced wilderness with a capital W uh, for some years and it was really important for me to have this experience now, a different time of my life, different set of responsibilities, different viewpoint uh, given the work that I do as Outdoor Afro. And significantly it was important for me because I'm asking people all the time to overcome their personal and, and logistical barriers to get connected to the outdoors. And I felt that it was important uh, step for me to take to practice what I preach and step out of my own comfort zone and mm -hmm. to really get myself familiarized with places that are really hard to understand and develop empathy for unless you experience them firsthand and it was it was really uh, I mean I, I cannot say enough how life-changing that experience was and and how I'm still unpacking many parts of that experience but the thing that I, I, I really um, found to be most important was how do I tell the story of that experience and how do I make that story, that experience that I had relevant to the folks who are part of the outdoor Afro community? How can we relate what's happening in the Arctic to what's happening in some of our most stressed communities? And the thing that really came to fore for me in that experience was recognizing not the fragility of wilderness that we often think of in our day-to-day -day lives. In our day-to-day -day lives, uh, you know, we, we feel like we have a whole lot of control. We feel like we, you know, are at the top of things and we are able to influence a lot of things and that nature and, and especially the wild is, is something we have to be, be very um, careful of and almost think of in, a, in an eggshell kind of way. But I'll mm. tell you, when that bear visited our camp, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that uh, as the conversation continues, I realized that I was not at the top of the food chain. <laughs> and I realized that if that bear had decided to enjoy us as takeout that day, that <laughs> would keep on trucking. And so what was present for me in that moment was not specifically the, the, the delicate nature of, of, of the wilderness, but really the delicate uh, nature of humans and, 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 and our need to understand better what it means to be human. And I think that that's what the wilderness experience um, of, of, of you know, among many things, and not from a human-centric perspective, of course, but, but it has this one opportunity that's important, I think, for humans to experience at least once in their lifetime, and that is, you know, the fragility and how you fit into systems and how nature has it figured out and how we can learn about how to live and how to be more in our humanity and our compassion. Uh, through the experience of the wild. And so mm -hmm. having that experience, I, I feel more compelled than ever before to think of how might we link the intersections between 
the, the Wilderness Act with the, the Civil Rights Act, which coincidentally was signed 50 years ago uh, in this year. And what does that mean? What does it mean to, um, to, to facilitate and champion access for everyone to be able to interact with these spaces and, of course, eventually become stewards of them, but also stewards of our humanity within them? That's great. Well, thank you, Rue. Thank you. Let me uh, let me just go ahead and see if uh, Paul, you have a few comments to add. Yeah, I mean, the funny thing for me, going with Sierra Club and meeting these incredible um, and quite colorful folks, um, is there is a sense of um, I'm looking at everything from Frank L. Baum's, um, you know, the the Wizard of Oz, where we're, you know the people are on this path to try and to figure out. Uh, their own interior, like they're they're all looking for something, and they realize it's inside them. Um, I love that myth or parable of the beginning of um, you know when Dorothy gets caught in a storm and she's not in Kansas anymore. You know, um, there's a sense of humor about the 21st century that I have that we all know that things are changing, uh, but it's like the the elephant in the room uh, that we can't seem to uh, kind of all of us are describing different things. I mean, the 21st century. Um, as we see more and more, the, the use of social media, uh, the, the implicit sense that we share experiences in a radically different way than even a generation ago. Um, those are things that are deeply structural shifts um, in how we think about what it means to create stories and narratives. Um, I went to Antarctica uh, in a different context and wrote a book called The Book of Ice about that kind of experience, but I'm also looking at some of the explorers like Matt uh, Henderson, uh, who um, helped set up the exploration of uh, the North Pole with Robert Perry. Um, I'm also thinking about the 50th anniversary of the Civil Rights Act uh, that Rue uh, so generously noted earlier uh, occurs around the same time. So, um, if anything, this summer has showed us that social upheaval and environmental upheaval are intricately tied together, uh, whether it's Ferguson or whether it's a Civil Rights Act for the idea of nature itself. Um, I think we need to really expand our sense of being stakeholders. And going on this trip, um, when I talk about stakeholders, it's like the, the social contract, not with just other people, but with the environment and the climate itself. I mean, we really, uh, going on this trip blew my mind on so many levels. Uh, whether it was the, the sheer volume of mosquitoes that were looking for to, to get blood, <laughs> or the sheer volume of amusing uh, kind of anecdotes um, beginning with the, the myth of the, the, the polar bear, um, you know, which I loved the fact that many people are like asking, are there polar bears in, in Antarctica? And you realize, no, there's not. Uh, but when we started with that grizzly coming up, it was like there was a grizzly bear that approached our camp and tentatively, you know, held itself in the air and just sniffed the air and then just sort of casually walked away. Um, if we, if it, had got, it could have gone in a lot of different directions, and I'll leave it to the audience to imagine what would you would do if a grizzly comes within about 20 feet of you and just kind of makes contact and then decides it's not interested and walks away. It, it, it left me, um, it left a kind of an interesting endorsement in the whole trip. That's great. Well, thanks, Paul. We'll uh, come back and love to hear some more uh, personal experiences the three of you guys had up there in a second. Uh, Michael, do you have uh, some comments to add uh, before we open it up? Sure do. Uh, so hi, everybody. Michael Bruin, Executive Director of the Sierra Club. And for those of you who don't know, uh, there were eight of us who spent uh, a little bit less than a week up in the Arctic Refuge at the end of June and early July. We uh, landed in the northern part of the Brooks Range and then uh, floated down, really up, northern uh, uh, on the Achillic River all the way to the Arctic Ocean. Um, and then we had a visit with the native community in Kaktovik on our way out of town as well. Um, so the other thing you should know is that this is the first time that we've seen each other, uh, the three of us at least, uh, on screen. So Rue and Paul, it's great to see your smiling faces. Great to see um, you. <laughs> Uh, and then also, just wanted to give a quick shout out for the other members of our trip. We had Peter and Dan, who were our guides. Dan, I uh, hope you're uh, watching this. Dan also works for the Sierra Club and runs our work that uh, is working to secure protection for some of the most beautiful places on the planet up in Alaska and throughout the Pacific Northwest. 
We also had Micah Baird, who took some amazing uh, photos and videos of our trip. Shirley Weiss Young, um, who's a member of our foundation, and uh, dear Jason Mark, who uh, was supposed to be on the call. He is out of range and couldn't, but he writes. Uh, he's an author um, and writes for the Earth Island Journal. So to all of you, uh, it's great. Uh, look forward to seeing you again. The thing that I wanted to highlight about the trip is that it was fun. And that's what a lot of uh, this is supposed to be about. There are lots of talk, there's lots of talk happening about wilderness destruction or preservation. There's lots of intellectual academic studies about protecting nature or humankind's role in nature in a warming world. But usually, when we're actually out and not talking on a computer screen, the sole purpose of getting out into nature is to have a great time. Uh, and that's what we were able to do. That's what millions of people are able to do every weekend or every week when they get, in, get out into nature. Part of uh, what people try to do sometimes is to lose themselves. Part of it might be able to, might be to try to find themselves. Um, but really, we want to connect with who we are, what's important in our lives, the people that we love, and to have an amazing experience. So really, even though this was something of an exotic trip, going to uh, an amazing place that's far out of reach, uh, it really was a very common trip, and it's not much different from what people are doing in their backyards all the time. And today, we're having this conversation right on the cusp of the 50th anniversary of the Wilderness Act, which has been able to help millions of people produce great memories and great stories. Uh, when the Wilderness Act was first signed in 1964, uh, it helped to secure the protection of 9 million acres, and it's since been expanded to 110 million acres all around the country. Uh, and it's also served as a model for other countries to help protect the places that are most important to them. And as Dan said at the beginning, there are a lot of places that we're working to continue to protect, whether it's in the greater Canyonlands area, down in uh, south Eastern Utah, the Grand Canyon watershed, up in Boulder White Clouds, there are some beautiful places that still need added protection from coast to coast all around the country. Um, so I guess I wanted to end just by saying, Rue and Paul, it's great to see you again. Thank you for the great experience. And um, about that grizzly bear, um, <laughs> I do think it, re it reveals um, something about a person's character when you see a grizzly bear that's 20 feet away. And, um, you know, I, I guess I wanted to share that I was really disappointed that when we saw the grizzly bear, um, the first thing that Rue did wasn't to try to protect everybody, but tying my shoelaces <laughs> together to make sure that I wasn't the fast runner. It was just way, <laughs> way, way out of bounds. And so... I was out. I was out. <laughs> just kidding. For the record, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You well, know, thanks, Arit. It sounds yeah, like a great trip. Yeah, Go ahead, Rick. Yeah, a great trip. And, Mike, I want to thank you for pointing out one thing, and that was the re it was about fun, and it was about our relating to each other. And and I, I really felt like we were lucky in having a high-capacity group that knew how to take care of ourselves and one another. But yeah. I also have to give a shout-out to the folks uh, in the Arctic Village, the Quichin people, yeah. and uh, and the folks in Kaktovik who um, – helped us to understand the landscape from a different perspective and that one that is one that dep has depended and has understood how to be connected to that land for tens of thousands of years yeah. hearing the stories about how how some of the practices and ways of life have to be relearned is another part of the narrative of that region that we we have to keep in front of us and is you know connected to from my perspective, a civil rights issue. Um, so I just want to, you know, thank um, Princess and, and all of those who acted as midwives and supporters um, when we were stuck because of weather. Um, it, you know, it was a very humbling experience to stay uh, in the church on the floor and um, amidst everyone snoring and sharing meals and you know. And so th there was, it was fun, but it was also challenging. And and and, but it was through those challenging challenges that we were able to really connect deeply as human beings um, and with the culture. Yeah. You know, can I jump in for a second here? I want to. Um, I kind of just want to riff on the fact that. There was a sense that when you when we arrived at some of the smaller uh, the second town, there was a kind of an interesting situation where you could see large scale government buildings and installations, 
Um, but next to it was a community that had set up a situation where they were they were they had their own police. They had their own. They were cooking a meal. There was a little bit before July Fourth. Um, it was it was you know my first encounter with an American uh, kind of First Nations people. And the funny thing is, I was looking at electronic music, so I was thinking about. There's a group called the Tribe Called Red uh, that's quite popular right now, and they're doing a, an event called uh, the Electric Pow Wow. And um, it's all um, First Nations peoples who are making electronic music and hip-hop. And I met a really amazing uh, MC, Akumatu, and also a princess, uh, Lukash. I'm not sure I'm pronouncing the names right, but I want to make sure to give them a shout-out. And um, she was playing me a lot of tracks on her cell phone of um, hip-hop and techno and stuff that she had made using um, her, her history. And they're, the funny thing is, the Smithsonian... Um, had an archive of their records, you know, because some anthropologists had gone to their village and recorded it, and those records are now um, in an archive that they're just beginning to listen through. So she was making electronic music out of it, and that was a really uh, poetic kind of sense of history, technology, and um, just surreal. I mean, it, like some of the sunglasses the, the First Nations peoples were wearing are still in my memory. It was really, uh, it was really charming. Yeah. Well, that's great, and you know the. Um the, our Wild America campaign, I think, really came about around the sense that at the end of the day, having uh, wild outdoors really provides these shared experiences that, especially around things that are um, unknown or unexpected, and that those, in some ways, are the most uh, lasting experiences uh, for folks are uh, coming across those things in nature. So, one of the things that um, uh, questions that came across was as we think about. Uh, the opportunity to have these shared experiences uh, in nature. Uh, any advice on how to uh, reach and engage uh, folks in the younger generation who are uh, often accused of uh, having their heads buried in screens and, and electronic uh, devices? And how do we get them uh, engaged in something like wilderness protection? Well, I think for, from my perspective and the work that I do as Outdoor Afro that's designed to reconnect people who look like me to the outdoors, visual representation is a huge part of that answer. Mm. They have to locate themselves in those places. They have to locate their experiences, their heritage. If not literally, they have to find some ways of, of relating. And I think that if we are leveraging technology, if we are inviting different people to tell the story than the usual suspects, those are entry points that allow people to build and think of themselves as connected. Um, so we, we, to some extent, we have to change the face of, of who we imagine engages with the wild and then find ways to bring those wild experiences, as, as Mike Brun alluded to, um, into the imagination and, and the relevancy of what people are already doing in their day-to-day -day lives and, and perhaps even in urban setting. You know, I, I want to jump in here as well because I think the, the issue is you can't, um, you know, try and ba bash people over the head to get them to go where you want them to go. You have to start with where they are. And mm -hmm. if we live in a society that essentially is kind of slowly moving toward, or not even slowly, I'm talking rapidly, moving towards an information-based economy, we have to think about the environment as a commons, as a place where people share information, and that nature itself is a different kind of, of information. And I think if you can put it in a context where people understand that they, they are stakeholders, um, it's hard to argue with a storm that just smashed your house. It's hard to think about... The, the notion that policy is some abstract, huge system that somehow can reallocate resources without feeling like you're a stakeholder in that. Um, and I think it's incredibly important that we, we can begin the dialogue of both environmental issues and trying to raise literacy about uh, climate change from the viewpoint of how the arts can spark reimagination. And that's where it was so beautiful to um, hang out with everybody and compare notes. That was what this trip, for me, it was, it was much more of a catalyzer um, I think individually, each of us, as people who are participants, have brought something different to the mix. Yeah. And I wanted to underscore what Paul just said. So you have DJ Spooky, this internationally renowned hip-hop artist um, who was maybe unintentionally quoting one of the tenets of grassroots organizing from Saul Alinsky, right, which is you start with where people are. And whether yeah. that, that's true whether you're working to stop a toxic waste incinerator in Kettleman City, California, or a coal plant in the south side of Chicago, or whether you're talking about getting people into the outdoors. Um, so I think that in this case, screens are not the enemy, right? So 
tablets and phones uh, used mm -hmm. by young people or whoever in wilderness or in the backyard park are our friends. If this is what people are interested in and if they want to take pictures or videos, um, that's great. Anything that will help people to have a, a wonderful experience and to share that with others. Um, I think that we need to be really open to letting people enjoy the experience in ways that are meaningful to them and understand that that's going to be different from how we enjoyed it, but also similar in pretty profound ways. Yeah, that's great. Uh, any questions out there on Hangout, you can go ahead and submit them and <clears throat> we'll go ahead and uh, ask the uh, folks here on the Hangout if uh, they could answer those. Um, so the other question that, that came across is, you know, 50 years ago, uh, protecting wilderness, the Civil Rights Act, um, it was also, uh, tomorrow is also the 50th anniversary of the Land and, Con Land and Water Conservation Fund being uh, established. Uh, it was truly bipartisan, almost unanimous uh, votes to establish those landmark uh, laws. How, how have we gotten to the place now that is, it is seen as a partisan issue or uh, a political issue? Any insights on that, protecting lands? Well, I'll say something real quick. You know, I, I, we're living in a time where almost everything is polarized, and it's polarized to a degree to which um, I think is a little bit artificial. You know, clearly there are big distinctions about vision for where the country should go, uh, big divisions on a range of social and economic issues and environmental issues. But I think when it comes to wilderness and protecting nature, even more generally, um, there's a, an enormous amount of common ground. You know, most Americans are fond of parks and healthy forests. Whatever they choose to do in those forests, might have, there might be great differences. A lot of people hunt fish, people like to mountain bike, some people like to go on ORVs. Um, some people like to hike and have very clear and uh, pristine wilderness experiences. But most people do connect with the basic, very basic notions of clean air, clean water, healthy parks. And I think that there is an opportunity to use nature and our experiences in nature as a way to bridge divides and to try to reconcile the sometimes pretty profound differences that we have. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, you know, in the course of my lifetime, I don't think that this level of polarization uh, can sustain itself. I think that we're going to see over time more breakthroughs and people with a, wanting to make their political careers by bringing people together rather than accentuating our differences. It's clearly not where we are now and I don't know if wilderness will be the one thing that does bring us together but I definitely know that it helps tremendously. Great. Yeah, I want to just jump in as well because growing up in Washington DC which of course being the capital, Rock Creek Park was one of the kind of the areas that when I was a kid, um, and DC is a predominantly African American city, um, or it used to be actually, it's changing a lot. But um, the park really, really set the tone from everything from there's a great funk song called Doing It in the Park by Donald Byrd, for example. Um, if you look at what happened with, say, for example, Central Park as a comparative thing in New York, um, those are places where the city opens up and that everybody. Uh, I really want to kind of emphasize this idea of the commons. Um, and you're, uh, uh, Michael, there was such a good point, and Rua also. Uh, the, the basic sense is how do we make these parks kind of achieve a bit more of a cultural capital? And there's no way that you could take those parks away. I mean, I think so many people, uh, once we expand that idea and move further and further out, and think about cultural preservation versus land preservation, um, if people can get the idea of if they like Central Park or Rock Creek Park, they'll like many other uh, similar kind of areas. You'd be surprised how much that would be just, I, I, this is my own theory, but I, I really think that's the beginning. Um, and that's what this expedition was kind of about. We each carried the seeds of the ideas, bought it back, and we're going to see what happens with, with catalyzing what, each of our seeds. That's great. Rudy, have anything to, to add? No, I think I just can only echo um, uh, what's already been said and that, you know, when I'm out in nature, when I'm out with those trees, they don't see that I'm black. Um, <laughs> Bear didn't care. <laughs> um, and so I just feel like nature, like, you know, some of our, you know, most beloved technologies is the ultimate open platform. You know, mm -hmm. through which we can leverage, you know, to um, uh, make more visible our, our social and historical capital. Um, you know, when you think about land, you also you cannot 
you can't help but think about stories. You can't think about who occupied those spaces, who passed through, who's a current, who are the current stakeholders. And a huge part of the work I do is not only introducing people to places, but introducing people to the story of places. So I just think there's this opportunity to help people um, see their connectedness in to these wild places, historical and, um, and family narratives. Mm -hmm. So what I'm hearing is that, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Okay. Um, yeah, so what, I, what I'm hearing is that it's both a, uh, a shared resource, uh, a place, uh, as Paul says, commons that everybody has, uh, uh, has access to. In some ways, uh, it, it is really the foundation for the democracy that we have uh, in this country. And at the same time, it sounds like um, there is a need for more of a sense of shared responsibility to, to protect those collective assets uh, across the board and across ways. And uh, one way to do that, as, as you said, is to really uh, understand and think about where people are at and, and how you uh, engage them from that place wherever they are uh, to care about um, uh, that nature that's all around them. Um, any uh, any other questions that folks have on online that they uh, would like uh, Rue or Paul or Michael to answer? Great. Uh, well, I, I guess I have one. Is um, uh, beyond the the grizzly bear uh, experience and other wildlife experiences. What what uh, at the end of the day um, did you really, when you went home and talked to your family or your kids, really focus on as far as uh, as far as that thing that stuck with you from that trip? Um, do you, who wants to go first? <laughs> go for it, Paul. OK. Um, when I got back, the first thing I did was um, I started doing a research about the graphic design of expeditions. And usually, if you look at Matthew Hinton and Perry, um, if you look at some of the Yukon expeditions as well, even if you go a little bit earlier back to some of the British and um, French expeditions, um, everybody had a cool logo, a flag, something like that. Um, and so I eventually I'm going to be doing a, a kind of a, a book out of this whole project. And I've already written a, a rough draft of a string quartet we're going to premiere at the, at the gala for the Sierra Club. So um, the project so far, the tentative name is True North. And um, I wrote a string quartet called Arctic Rhythms, uh, looking at some of the disruption and the kind of um, uncertainty of tempo of the landscape. And one of the things that really struck me was um, I met one of the um, uh, chiefs of the uh, Gwich'in, and we were walking in the rain. Um, I had left everybody, and we were walking down this road. And um, he, he just actually was in a motorcycle. And he was saying, you know, this shouldn't be green right now. In fact, there were fires that had happened, and they were updating their vocabulary. They were trying to figure out. Um, they usually had different terms for ice and snow uh, that the landscape no longer matched. So they were, he was like, you know, by around this time, this, all this green was normally not here. And um, that, that really left an impression with me. So I'm trying to think of my, a couple art exhibitions and a couple um, music projects I'm, I'm already working on. Um, and you'll have a taste of that in a couple days in September. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody and getting first impressions of this, the string quartet I wrote um, from this expedition. That's great. Well, so I have another question that just came across. Can, you, can each of you uh, just give your sense of over the next uh, 50 years, what do you hope that uh, the wilderness movement will look like? Well, I think for me, um, it's it's fairly straightforward, and that is is that you know, we have people participating in wilderness, advocating in wilderness feeling connected to wilderness, um, you know, particularly in, in proportion to their population and, and their opportunity to access it. And I think that through the work that we're doing today, through this, this experience, I think we are breaking down barriers of understanding as a start. Mm -hmm. um, but, mm -hmm. you know, I'm really working toward a, a point of no big deal. Um, there will not be a parade that will, you know, drive down the street once we've achieved the goal of ordinariness and relevancy, um, but we will notice it. We will notice it as, as subtly as we've noticed that you can no longer smoke in restaurants and bars. 
Um, and I think that that's a kind of culture sh shift um, that that will will signal uh, the success of, of this work, and more importantly, su signal the success of 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 the continued preservation and expanded preservation of our wild spaces. That's great. So it becomes a norm in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'll go quickly. You know, I think the movement you know, over the next 50 years, I hope that it will become certainly much more inclusive. Uh, people of all races and all uh, economic st status statuses. Um, more inclusive of Republicans as well as Democrats and independents, people who are mm -hmm. very conservative uh, and also very progressive. Um, but more than all of that, I think uh, a sense of joy that uh, we... We lead, many of us lead busy lives. Uh, many of us have um, hard things that we go through in our lives. And that wilderness can be a tonic. It can be a way to uh, find what it is that can bring us all together. And so um, in a lot of our advocacy work, there's a lot of finger wagging. There's a lot of uh, castigating and demonizing. Um, there's a little bit of moralizing. And um, maybe some of that is at least somewhat close to being necessary. But I also think, particularly for wilderness preservation, we can bring more of our humanity and a greater sense of, of joy into the work to protect nature um, and getting ourselves away from our desks and computer screens out into nature more as well. That's great. And, um, I just want to chime in there to say the issue is about literacy. And I think if you get people to feel like this is a story that they are telling, this is a story they're participating in, they're going to want to change the plot. You know, and I think that there's a serious mm -hmm. discrepancy right now between how we think about the data, because um, the data is very clear. Climate change, deep structural impact. It's now the Anthropocene era. And when I say Anthropocene, I'm talking about our actions are man-made. You know, our actions are generating uh, radical change. So the next step is, if, we, if this is a story we understand, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, the plot, the story, you'd be surprised. People... Um, if once there's a narrative action in place, if I'm thinking about the next 50 years, I think it's about rewriting the story between how people think about their relationship to nature, not as something that's abstract and different, because that's a very 19th century model. Um, mm -hmm. If you think about the, the, the beginning of the American Parks Movement, it was very tied to the American Transcendentalist Movement, people like Thoreau, people like Walt Whitman. Um, so the next 21st century update is going to have to be people feeling like where where are these new kinds of philosophies and stories coming from? And that's going to be um, everything from how music affects culture to how science could now be part of the code of culture. Um, and that's where I think we're going to be seeing a lot of evolution. I don't view it as these separate um, issues. And, when, and that was something both Michael and Ruth pointed out. There's a very deep polarization. But, the, but nature affects everybody. So it's going to have to be something that people can come together on. And regardless of political ideology, uh, regardless of class and race. Like I said earlier, it's hard to argue with a storm that just smashed your house. Um, and I think uh, once people really get past all of that kind of stuff, there's going to be a lot of common ground. and that's Great. Well, any final words from you, uh, Rue, about that? Yeah, I just, you know, I, I always go back to love, you know, that this is this is the ultimate love story. Mm. And, um, and you know, and, and the earth, um, you know, can receive our love and it can receive other types of behavior. And <laughs> we're living in a time when earth is, the wild is responding uh, to how we've treated it. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, now is the time um, to, to not only act in terms of policy, but, but to, to, to get to the core of what this is about. And this is about showing love, showing love for our planet, showing love for our wild that ultimately helps us to show love for one another. Amen, sister. Go ahead, Mark. I just said amen, sister. <laughs> yeah, well, that's powerful stuff. <laughs> well, uh, with that, I think that's a great, great way to kind of end this uh, half hour. Um, we've got uh, hundreds of people across the nation that joined us for the Hangout today, house parties all over the place. Um, Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Hugh. I'm the director for the Our Wild America campaign. We're so excited to uh, have been able to host this uh, hangout with all of you today. And um, I, I'm really inspired walking away from this. And we hope this uh, 
kind of sparks uh, ongoing conversations in those house parties across the nation right now about uh, about the value of wilderness for for folks in in those houses and and uh, what they can do to to help out. So really appreciate all all of your time together. Um, I look forward to seeing all of you here in a few weeks uh, at the Wilderness Week celebrations here in D.C. and um, it's just been a, it's just been a, a treat to have all of you on and um, uh, maybe next year I'll try and get up to the Arctic with all of you. So <laughs> sounds good. Man. Thank you so much and thank you to the Sierra Club for all your work and, and commitment to this this campaign. Great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Okay.